Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. Today on the show, we have Leo Galland, MD. Dr. Galland has received international recognition as a clinician, researcher, educator, and best-selling author. A graduate of Harvard University and the New York School of Medicine, he is listed in America's top doctors and leading physicians of the world. He has received numerous professional awards and has published numerous scientific articles and textbook chapters. He's been interviewed for the New York Times, Newsweek, Good Morning America, MSNBC, Fox News, and more. His last book, called The Allergy Solution, co-written with his son Jonathan, was the subject of a public television program of the same name, which has aired over a thousand times. Now, you might be wondering, why is Dr. Gallen our guest today on We Don't Die Radio? Well, I'm happy to report that he's also the author of the book called Already Here, A Doctor Discovers the Truth About Heaven. You can find out more about this amazing man at his website, which is drgalland.com. Dr. Leo Galland, a warm welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Great to be talking with you today, Sandra. Oh, great also to have you here. Dr. Galland, where are you in the world? Am I guessing that you're around New York State? Uh, I'm in New York City. Okay. Um, Manhattan, Greenwich Village, actually. Gotcha. Always just nice to have a idea where you are. And I'm sitting in my cozy house and just north of Boston, Massachusetts, as we talk today. Well, Dr. Gallen, you know your story much better than I and the questions. If you wouldn't mind just giving a little bit of background about you and maybe how you got into medicine, and then we can move on to find out about your, well, your book that we're talking about today and your son. Well, I, I actually entered medicine with the idea of being a research scientist. But um, quickly found that I loved interacting with people more than test tubes and petri dishes and chromatographs, and so I became a clinician. I um, have several children, um, but one of them, Christopher, um, who was one of triplets, was brain damaged shortly after birth and was a special needs child who was very challenging uh, to himself and to others. Uh, He was amazing in uh, so many ways because of his outgoing friendliness, his um, sense of humor, the poetry that would sometimes grace his speech. But he engaged in constant attention-getting behavior, was very frustrated by the, his physical limitations, constantly banging into things, um, unable to do all the things that his brothers could do. Uh, and um, he lived that way for 22 years. Now, it was Christopher's death that totally changed my perspective on life and on the universe. And I came to realize that Christopher had been my teacher all along, in life as well as in death. And uh, already here recounts that journey. It starts with the moment of his death, and then uh, goes backwards and forwards to describe what I learned from Christopher and the evidence that he showed me of immortality. Now, I just want to say that as a scientist, uh, most scientists don't believe in uh, concepts like immortality. Right. But it's really important to understand what science is. Modern science is a method for knowing and understanding reality based upon experience rather than precept. And that's a description that was um, coined in the 17th century by the foremost philosopher of science at that time, Roger Bacon. And um, uh, actually, I think it was Francis Bacon. But um, he 
he was distinguishing a system of knowledge based on experience from the systems that had dominated Europe since uh, the ancient Greeks, which were based on the teachings and precepts of Aristotle. Now, experiment is a special type of experience. We tend to associate science with experiments. Ex an experiment is just a way of structuring experience, but it is really about being true to experience and paying attention to it. And the experiences that I had as a result of Christopher's death were experience, direct experiences of immortality. And if I were to ignore them, which is what most so-called scientists tend to do, I would not be really scientific. I would be ignoring experience. And uh, what I did was to pay attention to this experience and allow it to open my mind. So the way the story went, um, Chris was 22 and he'd finished his education. And so he went to live in a community in the Berkshires in Western Massachusetts near the town of Great Barrington. It's a, it's a community called, um, based upon a principle of life sharing that is the, the adults and the people who are um, brain injured um, live together. They share their lives. Um, Chris was on a farm and was, and was doing farm work, basically, to the extent that he could. He was building things. He was taking care of animals. Uh, and he was there for nine months, which is an interesting period of time. Uh, at the end of in early November, after he'd been there for for about nine months, um, I got a call when I returned to my office from lunch that an emergency room in Great Barrington had called. They were resuscitating Christopher. He had gone on a hike, a short hike with some other members of the community, had separated from the group. He had a seizure disorder. We think he had a seizure, tumbled down in an embankment, and drowned in about two inches of water. Um, they were resuscitating him. He, his temperature was very low. They, they had no response at all. They wanted to know what to do. And I asked them to keep warming him uh, because hypothermia can protect the brain. Maybe when they warmed him up, he would revive. And I had all these crazy fantasies in my head about uh, as well as, as unspeakable fears about what this would mean for Christopher. Would he actually benefit from this in some crazy way? Or was he going to be even more disabled? Right. My wife came over, and we were sitting in my office waiting for a phone call. And the f I don't know if you've ever been in a situation like that. It is the most powerless feeling in the world. You, you can barely move. It's hard to breathe. Everything looks dim. You feel the, the air itself feels heavy. And there's nothing to say. He was 150 miles away from us. We, it's not as if we could even, even had a chance of getting there. Wow. All of a sudden, the room, it felt as if there was some kind of high voltage in the room, like lightning was about to strike. And my wife and I had exactly the same experience. And we both stood up at the same time. The room filled with an intense, bright light. Now, when I say the room, it's not as if we were exactly in the room. We weren't seeing this with our eyes. We were more seeing it with our minds. Uh, and the source of that light was a being that both of us recognized as being Christopher. He had Christopher's face, only it was perfect and beautiful, uh, without all the scars from Christopher's many mishaps. And there was the body was not so easy to, to discern. It was kind of like this oblong form with Christopher's face at the apex. 
and light radiating out from it, and it was rising up as if it were a rocket being launched. What was the most remarkable thing was the incredible feeling of blissful joy and power that radiated from this being, which was like nothing I had ever experienced or have experienced since. I mean, it was, it, it transfixed you. It was, took your breath away. It was just overwhelming. Um, he was there for, with us for, I don't know, 10 seconds or so. And then he was gone and the phone was ringing. And we knew what we would hear on the other end that, um, yeah, they, uh, that the resuscitation had failed because right. we both knew we had just seen Christopher's soul. And it was, it was just an incredible gift. I mean, we couldn't, that we couldn't get over. Of course. Um, so despite that, we, uh, um, I don't know how much it, that it actually affected our grief. That's the crazy thing. We were, we had had this vision of something supernatural and divine, and we had seen how um, how happy Chris was. And at the same time, we were just devastated by what had happened to him. And we had to tell his brothers and other members of the family, which was really difficult. I, my first, one of my first thoughts was, you know, wow, I always knew Chris was amazing. I never realized how amazing he was. And is there a being like that inside me and f inside everyone? Yes. Is that what we <laughs> really are? Yeah, right. So um, uh, over the next several months, actually, uh, when I was feeling really sad or mourning or in despair, I would keep returning to that vision that we would had almost as if it were a drug, you know, oh, I want, I want to be there. I mean, I want to be in that place with Christopher. I want to feel that joy and power now. So that was the first, um, that was the first event. If that were the only thing that had happened, I eventually would have come to dismiss it as a shared hallucination. Right. Probably. Mm -hmm. But, um, it wasn't the only thing that happened. And what followed was in some ways even more dramatic. Uh, we buried, we decided to bury Chris in the Berkshires it, because he had been this, he had been such an important part of this community. And we felt that it would be easier for them to uh, accept his loss if he were there, if the ceremony were there. So, we drove up to the Berkshires, and um, there was a funeral mass. There was a burial. I got this um, instinct, felt as if it came out of nowhere, this impulse, that is, felt as if it came out of nowhere, um, to um, release balloons at his graveside. And so we got 22 yellow helium balloons, um, which we had... Um, I thought they'd just be delivered to the grave. They were actually delivered to the church. They were attached to yellow ribbons and were tied to a sandbag. Um, at the graveside, um, I tried, I went to hand them out to the people who were there to release, uh, but they were so tightly tied. I couldn't untie the knots and I used someone's pen knife to cut them. So each balloon had about a 12 inch um, rib length of ribbon attached to it, not the usual two to three feet that you see. So that was, I think, on a Saturday afternoon. And we released them. They flew skyward and disappeared. The next day, we drove back to New York City. As we were driving down Broadway, we came to Columbus Circle and were stopped in a lot of traffic. And a yellow balloon descended from the sky and hovered right in front of our car, about 10 feet off the ground. Now, my first thought was, wow, isn't that a coincidence? Correct, we just released right. yellow balloons. But then I noticed that the yellow ribbon on the, uh, on the balloon was only about 12 inches long. 
and the balloon looked like it was about a day old. Mm-hmm. Also, this was a cold, windy day in November. There, we were close to Central Park, but there's no way that this is a balloon that someone purchased in the park and lost. This balloon was coming down, not going up. And it was. Uh, there were five people in the car. This was not a vision. This was like ordinary sensory experience. We all saw it. And this was clearly there. And it clearly had clearly was about a day old and it could come from somewhere else to settle in front of our car. And then it kind of bobbed away. I wanted to try and retrieve it. I couldn't. It was too far. And the balloon itself didn't matter what I it, it felt to me as if Christopher were kind of laughing at me. And he was saying, you know, I know you. You would have come to dismiss the vision that I gave you of the immor- of my immortal soul. So I'm sending you this because I would like you to explain right. how this is just a coincidence. Yeah, explain this, Dad. So, and it's 150 yeah, right, miles, right, is it, from right. Great Barrington to New York City? 150 miles right. from Great Barrington to New York. Mm-hmm. Now, sure, I, I mean, I figured out, yeah, it's possible that the balloon could have traveled 150 miles in a day. But it came right to the spot that we were as as we passed through it. Right. And Columbus Circle, because it was named after another Christopher, had a kind of special meaning. Oh, yes, yes. Never even thought of that. Sure. I, yeah, because there, there was a place we used to live where there was a statue of of uh, Christopher Columbus with his name in Italian. It said Cristoforo Colombo. And so mm-hmm. I used to call Christopher Cristoforo. And he would laugh, you know, because it sounded so strange to him. Yeah. Um, so that, so it was as if he, had, and we don't usually take that route when we're heading home from, um, being out of the city. It, it was just, we just happened to do it that day. So, um, I realized that I had to really try to understand and digest this and that clearly Christopher was not only with us and alive, but, and happy, but he actually had the ability to influence a physical event that was occurring in, in our world. Sure. And that was pretty amazing. Can I just ask Dr. Um, Gallen, did you have a sense of faith or believing in, or even interested in any afterlife topics before any of this happened? Just curious. I mean, I, I would say that I've always been interested in what you might call the meaning of life. The, but I, I always kind of assumed that there were questions that, to which there would never be answers. So, so that it, it just seemed to me that we would never know, like, what is this, you know, why are we here? Are we just here by chance? I could accept that, that this, that the existence of life and the universe itself was some kind of random event. Um, if, if that's, I mean, if that's the best we could, we could discover about it. Uh, I always had a feeling that I wanted to, that I certainly wanted to understand more, but I had developed the habit of really living in the moment and it didn't really matter what happened afterwards, what was important was to me was what I was doing, right. uh, how I interacted with other people, my work, my relationships with my family. Yes. Um, the, the, so I, I viewed life as a journey, um, but not necessarily a religious journey. Okay, that makes sense. With a destination. And um, this made me, I mean, the first thing was I kind of lost my fear of death. It was like, if, if this is, I mean, if this is what death is, whenever it comes, that's, you know, fantastic. I mean, there's nothing to fear here. There's release, there's joy, there's, a unity with something so much more powerful and greater 
then your then my own individual self that I'll keep doing what I'm doing as well as I can, but with no fear of the transition. Now, over a period of time, so I had no more interactions with Christopher for some time after that. Uh, My wife, Christina, who tends to be much more intuitive about things than I am, would often say, I feel Chris's presence. And I mean, I would kind of go along with it. I wanted to be in the spirit of the moment for her, but I, I just never had that experience until about five years later when I was flying to Los Angeles to give a talk. And um, the plane, I've fl- flown in Los Angeles many times. This was the only time that the plane actually flew directly over the Grand Canyon. Now, what's important about the Grand Canyon is that at the time um, of Christopher's death, I was planning a trip to the Grand Canyon by car with Chris and our youngest son, Jordan, that would take place maybe the next summer when Jordan was out of school. Um, Because... I wanted to spend more time with Chris and he was pretty good in the car and loved being around Jordan. Um, and I thought the three of us could really have a, a, a special time together. That never happened. But the last words that Christopher said to Christina were, I can't wait to go on that trip. Oh. And he was referring to the Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon trip. Yes. So the plane was flying over the Grand Canyon and I came to realize where we were And all of a sudden, I had this intense experience as if I were outside the plane and Christopher was with me. And tears rushed to my eyes. I mean, it was, and I immediately called Christina once we'd passed the the canyon and told her what had just happened. And it was, um, and then about two months, and that that was it for that brief visit a very powerful visit. Um, About two months later, I was awakened during the night with a voice that seemed to be Christopher's saying, you have to tell my story. People need to know. And so I started planning the book, which I wrote um, already here. Um, And over the next several months, as I describe in the book, Um, I had a series of conversations with Christopher Spirit in which he basically, it was, it was essentially an initiation and he slowly began to enhance my understanding of the universe. And afterlife is not the term, is not a term that he used. Because among the lessons that he gave me was an understanding of the illusion created by time. Oh. Can I ask how he came Um, to you? Was it a vision? Was it just you could hear his voice in your mind? Was it you just had this knowing that wasn't there before? Just curious. It was, oh, I definitely heard a voice. The voice came from within me. It was in my mind. It wasn't Uh an ordinary like an auditor, auditory hallucination. Right. Um, I almost never saw him. There was once in the desert outside Palm Springs where I, I, I did have that visual. But for the most part, I was always alone. Um, that, was, that seemed to be the key. Um, but it didn't have to be any special place. I mean, it happened walking on the beach. It happened in um, the desert in California, but it also happened in my kitchen as I was cleaning up uh, after after dinner. Other members of my family had kind of gone into the living room, and I had decided I'll just clean up the table. And so, and that was like the most mundane of circumstances. Um, and that was, in many ways, the most profound conversation that we had. And um, 
the voice, uh, he didn't use the kind of words that Christopher used in life. It wasn't as if, oh, Chris, Christopher the boy, the brain-damaged child is talking to me. But he identified himself as Christopher, and I recognized that this was not my own voice. I, I, these were not thoughts that I, were, that I had ever had, even if, if they were um, thoughts that felt right to me. And some of them didn't. Some of them felt really hard to follow. Uh, others I felt very simpatico with. But, nice. um, um, but these, these did not feel like my thoughts, and this was not my voice. And, and it was often it came in response to my asking questions. Um, and sometimes the question would be kind of lighthearted. And then I would get a response that was way beyond what I had expected or was looking for. Um, and the f- pretty much the final conversation started with my kind of offhandedly I was thinking about Chris and I said, what's it like in heaven, Chris? And what he said to me really was pretty mind boggling. And it took me many years to try and really understand what I think that what I think it means because, and, and that's where the title of the book already here, here comes from. Um, so the first thing he said was, um, and I could hear the joy in his voice. It's what I always wanted. Everyone is here. Everybody, even you, that sent a chill down my spine. Yes. Um, and, uh, and of course that is the way that Christopher was. I mean, Chris loved being around other people. He loved interacting with them on any terms. And if he didn't get the kind of interactions he wanted, he was, this was part of his attention getting behavior, but he would do anything to drive you crazy. He would do nothing that was mean or hurtful, but he constantly wanted you to be interacting with him. And so, yeah, I, when he said, it's what I always wanted, everyone is here, everybody. Yeah, that was Christopher. Um, So then when I asked him about, and he said, everyone, even even me, and I would always challenge Chris's voice, you know, when he came to me. I would, if he said something, because I was always trying to be logical, and if he said something that I didn't necessarily think made sense, Uh I, I would challenge him and see if I could get a response. So I said, In that conversation, I said, well, what about the evil ones? What about Adolf Hitler? Is he there? And I could feel it was as if Chris were losing his breath. It was like this sigh or something, like the air got sucked out of the room. There was a cold chill. And and then he said to me, you have to understand the nature of evil. And the a lot of things happen in the world that are bad, but they're not evil. And then at this time, he explained to me the reason that there is a, a, a physical universe. Basically, that he, he had previously been leading me up to this, but it came through most clearly there. God, the divine, is loving. It's not that God loves. God is not a separate being that loves. God is loving. And for loving to be, there must be separation. And the universe exists to create that separation. With an infinite number of beings, each loved and cherished for its own uniqueness. Evil is the perversion of that. It is the turning away from that love. To hate others because of their otherness, that is a crime against God. Because we are here to manifest divine love, which is 
cherishing every being for being the unique being that it is. That's beautiful. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, and and so, it, and it, and it 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 just seemed so clear to me. I mean, I had never expected to have such a clear understanding of why we're here, and and it was kind of it was kind of astonishing. Now, as I tried to figure out, well, what does this mean? <laughs> um, like scientific, does it mean anything scientifically? I discovered, and this is kind of, this is after the book. Actually, I discovered um, the world of quantum cosmology and Christopher's worldview. Uh, there, there's a, there are values that quantum cosmology doesn't talk about love, but the concept of the universe that Christopher led me to is totally consistent with the concept of the universe that's described by scientists who are um, creating this field of quantum cosmology. And um, that's actually reassuring to me because it brings two worlds that I'm very, uh, very close to together. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so the way that I, the way that I understand it, and this is what I meant about afterlife. Uh, um, I mean, Chris said to the big, there are two big illusions that human ha humans have, and they're related to the fact that we are these physical beings. And those are the illusions of time and space. Um, and that, um, cause at one point I asked him if, his uncle Jerry, who had died a number of years ago, was there with him, and he said, "Well, of course, where else would he be? Because, <laughs> and you know, and uh, um, yeah, as if yeah, th that should be obvious. Like, duh, Dad. Um, because <laughs> yeah. actually, for spirit, space isn't space is not doesn't matter. It's not a reality, and neither is time. That took me much. Lo my my world and and." my work is so involved with time and sequence. The sequence of events is really important in medicine that it really was hard for me to understand Chris's notion of time, which basically is that time is just a small segment of reality. And so the way that I come to see it is that we live in a world that is really dominated by time. Uh, space, we've gotten pretty good at overcoming space. We don't overcome time. Time sets all the rules. Um, and we are, while we are in this world, we are pinned to the arrow of time, which relentlessly moves forward in a straight line. But that is the world of time is a very small fragment of the total of the total universe and and that that's an that's something that quantum cosmologists and physicists seem to understand very clearly from a mathematical perspective and death is basically Unpin it, being unpinned from the arrow of time. Oh, I like how you said that. You, <laughs> yeah, that's and that's all it is. Now, of course, to some extent, you can do that through meditation, even while you're still here. Um, but it's just, it's a transition from this um, from this state to a much more to a much a state that surrounds it. Dr. Gallant, uh, it also sounds like he's been unpinned from the arrow of physical health too, being this radiant being and so wise. 
you know, and unpinned from the human brain as he was living here on earth. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, the, I mean, look, I work with the physical body all the time, but if we take the, pers- the, the te- what I learned from Christopher, that the physical body is simply a means to an end. And the end is always the same. It is the expression of divine love. And, um, but one of, there were, there were three teachings of Christopher's that, um, really, um, or let me just say that all the things that I learned from Christopher coalesced into what I'll call three themes and the, and timelessness, which was the most challenging was, um, was one of them. Um, but there were two others and the others really helped me understand Christopher and who he was. And, and in doing that helped me better understand the nature of being in reality. And, and so I call the, so I call these themes gifts. And, um, the first gift is the gift of the opposite. The gift of timelessness is the third gift. Okay. And the opposite basically is that's just a way that Christopher lived. Now, I mean, he was always looking for the opposite in every conceivable way. And if you didn't really, until I came to understand him, it just seemed to me as if, well, you know, that's, he's just oppositional. He's difficult. Sometimes it would be funny and sometimes it would be maddening, but that was just Christopher. But in fact, Christopher was really teaching me something basic and essential about the universe. He, in fact, was teaching everybody that he interacted with. If you could be open to understanding his, his teachings, one of Chris's really uncanny characteristics was that he had a way of instantly understanding what people thought about themselves. So um, if you thought that you were um, a really um, mature or generous Uh um, human being or really authoritative, he could totally shred that. I mean, he could, he could drive you crazy. He could turn you into a raving lunatic. He could, um, and and he did that over and over again. And he did it to me (laughs) on so many times. And, and even though I would think, okay, this isn't going to work. This is the wrong way to handle Chris when he's driving you crazy. Uh, (laughs) He was so persistent. Um, if you seem to be somebody who was, um, barely functioning because, because of Chris's handicaps and he wound up in situations where there were people who were far more handicapped than he was, sure. who, you know, were in, were, you know, a, a young man who was rocking back and forth tied to, um, a chair, right. speechless, self-injurious, he would treat people like that with really sincere dignity and respect. Just like this is an individual and I'm recognizing them as an individual. That was always the way he was. And if you put it, and if you were a loser, if you were someone who thought who really had failed, right. And he encountered a number of those people and and who just thought you they were losers and couldn't do anything right, mm-hmm. he would get them to take care of him in oh. such a way that that person would feel like a really strong, significant adult. 
That's beautiful. Feel their value. It is beautiful. Yes. And and he he could show you he could show you that whatever you thought about yourself was wrong. And that the opposite or not necessarily wrong, but that the opposite was also true. And that was his whole being while he was in the world was the search for the opposite. Pretty incredible and, boy you have. Yeah, it is. It is. And 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 what I realized um is that the opposite I mean the unity of opposites is the single principle that characterizes life in our universe. There is a unity of opposites that determines everything. And I have a, a chapter in the book in which I go into that and it, what it, it, you know, what it, um, and what it means and how Christopher seemed to understand it and teach it, um, in a kind of, um, in a rather remarkable way. And, and of course, the most important aspect of that for, for, for me and for already here is that is, is the relationship between Chris, Chris and me. That is in life, Chris was totally dependent on me. He couldn't really take care of himself. He always needed others to help him. I was the parent. He was the child. I was the teacher. He was the reluctant student. Um, but all along, he had been the teacher and I had been the student. And in death, that reversal of roles became even more significant and profound. And one of the reasons that I wrote already here is that I wanted to help people discover the Christophers in their own lives because there are many people like Christopher. And if we are open to what they can teach us, it will enrich our lives so much. There are many Christophers, Dr. Galland, and many people. And I can't help but think that every other being can also give us so many gifts in different ways. Yes. And, and that is the design. I mean, that is the design of the universe. That really is because the openness to other beings, the cherishing them for their uniqueness, learning from them, what goes on between us, that is divine. From what Christopher taught me, that is divine love, and that is what creates the universe. And by, by being open to that and manifesting it, we are actually part of the divine process that created this universe. This is just a genius, the son of yours. I'd like to ask you, too, what the third gift, the gift of presence, could you uh, describe uh, that? The gift of presence, yes. Well, I mean, one of the things about Christopher, um, well, first of all, yeah, how do I explain that one? Um, one of the things about Christopher is that he was always present in the moment, and that's what he wanted from other people. Um, you could not be distracted and doing something else around Christopher. He wouldn't allow that. That was part. Um, and he, whatever he did, that's what he did. I mean, if it was, if it was eating a cheeseburger, his whole being went into eating the cheeseburger. <laughs> and um, I have a little, uh, I have a letter from a psychologist that had worked with him uh, about that aspect of him. Now, in order to really understand and see the opposite in everything, you have to be 
um, you have to be fully present. If you're if you're multitasking, which so many of us do, watching the clock, trying to, um, and you're not fully engaged in the present moment, you miss the gift of the opposite because it's there all the time. And um, and I think these three gifts, the gift of the opposite, the gift of presence, and the gift of timelessness, are really related to one another. Um, and of course, if you if you really grasp timelessness, then it makes it possible for you to be fully present because it frees you from the distractions created by time. Can I just um, add something? I think it goes sure, perfectly aligned. I'm thinking about the cheeseburger. <laughs> And so many of us, whether we're on our computer or driving or multitasking, like how easy would it be to suck down a cheeseburger just to fill that growl in the stomach? But when we're present, the smell, the taste, the sensation of chewing, the sensation of being satisfied, all that's there. But the gift of presence is also telling me, and even just hearing your story about the times Christopher has come to you in the desert on the beach doing the mundane task of dishes you're in the present moment and i wholeheartedly let me get this word out wholeheartedly believe that when we are in the present that is our direct access to whether it's conversations that you've had with christopher when he's in the hereafter or any of us getting these signs and we're going to totally miss them if we are in our minds, if we are busy doing other things. So just that cheeseburger tells me, be present in everything we do, because like you say, already here, I say hereafter, because they are here just after their physical existence, but we're going to miss it if we cannot utilize this gift of presence. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Presence is essential to spiritual understanding. Right. Wow. I want to ask you a couple of more things. You had, there's a quote that says lighten up from Christopher. <laughs> so talk about um, that a little bit cuz we can right. find well, this yeah. human life very heavy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Significant. Well, yeah, that actually that that came out of the the conversation about evil. Um good, you know, and and the the origins and reason for our being here. And um, because what Christopher said about the evil ones is he said, there is, it's not as if there's a separate place like hell. The, because they, the evil ones are in eternal torment because they have subverted the reason for their existence which is the manifestation of divine love. And they have turned against that. And he said, I, he said, I can't say that their despair and torment in any way blunts our joy because it was all, that's the way it always has been and always will be. And that was kind of depressing to me actually, because, um, of the way that I tend to live and think I'm always trying to improve things and, and yes. make it better. And it's like, there's this goal that we're moving towards. And it was like, and so I kind of re retreated into my study and I was kind of, was brooding on it and thinking, all right, so the universe will never be perfect. Christopher said to me, well, not the way that you want it to be. And then, and then he said, you know how you like to tell stories about all the quirky things that I did while I was alive? Well, around here, some of us like to tell stories about you. And how, <laughs> that you makes know, me laugh because right. that means everybody's <laughs> yeah. telling stories about all of us. Okay. <laughs> right, right. You know, and how serious you are and how you're always trying to do the right thing and, and you know, lighten up. You're already here which is where the title of the book comes from. That is so yeah, special. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. 
Wow. Are you still in conversation with him and doing your mundane tasks and when your mind is No, actually, he said to me years ago, he said, I I asked him, I said, well, Chris, is there anything, what else do you have to, to tell me? And he said, I've told you everything you need to know. Now it's up to you. That's great. And I get it because you, like me, like so many of the guests were given this information and to be able to share it and live it, what more is there to do or say? It's really pretty genius. And I, I personally believe that when we close our eyes this last time here on earth, it's like crossing a finish line. When we open them, all of our loved ones are there. And you know, your radiant boys right. going to be right, right there. Even the ones, even the ones who are still here are there. <laughs> is I, I, what he is what Chris said to me. Oh, and that that's a mind blowing thing. But for me, and I know you know, energy, it, it, several forms of energy can be in the same place at the same time. I'm sitting in my living room. There's a wireless yeah. internet around me. There's television signals. There's all these things. And I, right. I believe that our loved ones in the hereafter are here as well. So it's just the flip side of that, that we are over there already here. <laughs> yes. Uh, and our human brains might not get it, but I think our souls do. And we, we can qu- quiet our minds that we can get how that makes sense. Right. And, right. And I, yeah, quieting the mind is really important. You can, if you quiet your mind and you can sort of mentally detach yourself from the arrow of time and you can feel, you can begin to immerse yourself into that greater reality. And when I do that, I know that Chris is there. I mean, that's the way. Incredible. That's the circumstance in which I feel Chris. Wow, what a gift he has been to your life, as with your other children, I'm sure, and and your wife. But what a gift you've been to us and sharing this story. Just before we connected, I, I downloaded a couple of your books, actually. And I'm really excited to get into Already Here. And Dr. Gallen, we just have a few minutes left, and I know we are not ones to toot our own horns, but I just wanted to let the listeners know just a few of the other books that you've written, and just because a couple of them really called out to me, and they made to other people as well. So I'm just going to take a a second to do that, just quick, because I'm on your website. And these are the titles. Uh, The Allergy Solution is one book. Of course, he's got Already Here. The Fat Resistance Diet, that uh, just on the book cover, I found some things that I didn't know existed. Gastrointestinal Dysregulation, uh, Connections to Chronic Disease. You've got The Heartburn and Indigestion Solution, The Natural Approach to Reverse Acid Reflux, Power Healing, which sounds very interesting, and super immunity for kids. And I know you've written plenty and that have, other things that have been published, but it is evident to me by not only already here, but the other books that you've written, that you have a passion and a commitment for people in our bodies and in our souls to really make the most and have the best life possible. And I want to thank you for who you've been, all the education and practice you've done, and what you're doing right now to carry this forward. And I think you're a remarkable man, and I feel very honored that we got to spend this time together today. I, I so appreciate that you've, you know, that you've given me the opportunity to talk with you and to talk with your listeners about my experience with Christopher. Wow. Do you have any closing words? I just I'm feel kind of pulled to say, listening right now, we do have a lot of grieving parents um, and other folks that are grieving the physical loss. But if you were to just to give a maybe just a couple of words 
of hope? Uh, well, uh, those that you miss, the grief is real. Mm-hmm. But they're not gone. And through your grief and through the love that you feel, you can connect with the with those that you've lost here because you haven't lost them. They've left this world of time, but they are with you in the in the universe, and they always will be because there is no time there. And actually, as Einstein said, there is no before and after. Those are illusions. Wow. Didn't know he said that. Brilliant. Yeah, I didn't either. He, a friend of his died, and in a letter that he wrote um, uh, to um, the widow of his friend, he said, yeah, physicists know that before and after are illusions, are illusions. So those that we think we've lost, they are with us forever. And if you can quiet your mind and detach yourself from the arrow of time, you can feel that. I personally so appreciate those words and what a great reminder. And I love being unpinned from the arrow of time. And that means being in the present moment, whether you're eating a cheeseburger, whether you're with another human being to be there fully present whether you're just alone with your own thoughts and you just take time to quiet your mind, who knows, Dr. Galland, how many other people, now that they've heard your story, have the possibility of having those kind of conversations with their loved ones. Okay. Thank you so much. Oh, yes. And for our listener, thank you for being here today. Uh, something exciting that's coming up for me is I'm starting to do my first live events I've got We Don't Die Boston coming up in February. We Don't Die Orlando coming up in March. And it will be, they will be, what I feel will be the best evidence of the afterlife. Several different speakers coming in from around the world, all filmed for those who can't be there physically with us. So they will be available in the future on the internet. But if you're someone who wants to take part in a very special weekend filled with great things, like things we talk about on this show. You can go to wedontdieboston.com or wedontdieorlando.com to find out more. Our home base for this show is wedontdieradio.com. And now we are up to 286 episodes. And if you are somebody that wants to get out of your own head and wants to be inspired, I invite you to visit the website, listen to one or more episodes. I offer some free things there, my audio, how to survive grief. I've got a PDF file, Sandra's 19 reasons to believe in the afterlife. And you can read a free copy of my book, We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death there. And it's by joining my email list, which is called my Insiders Club. So once again, we've been talking to Dr. Leo Galland. His website is drgalland.com. And in closing for this episode, my name is Sandra Champlain, and I'm always so delighted to be your host on We Don't Die Radio. I do believe that life is an education for the soul and that all of our lives here on earth are important. So remember those gifts from Christopher, the gift of the opposite. We can learn something from everybody and everything the gift of presence really be in the present moment and the gift of timelessness. Uh, it's just, it's just wonderful. And Christopher, I know you're listening and you're right there by your dad's side. So I want to thank you too for doing what you've done to help your dad help all of us. So thank you for listening and we'll see you soon. Mm-hmm.